thank you, Vince. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yesterday, we heard some very impressive and interesting results from the Lost Frontiers project, which really is showing us the way forward. Uh, what I want to do is to expand on the significance of uh, submerged landscapes in a global context, the themes that they're relevant to, and the challenges that I see uh, lying ahead of us. Uh, I think all of us are embarked on a, a research agenda that in my view is going to transform the way we look at world prehistory or world history as we should call it. I shall pick up on some of the topics that James Walker talked about at the end of yesterday's session uh, and also what I have to say will serve as a sort of introduction to topics that other speakers in this session will uh, talk about in more detail. Uh, obviously there's a lot to cover um, in a world perspective and I will skip rather lightly over some uh, issues. I will just put the PowerPoint on. Here we go. Now, uh, I should confess that I am a terrestrial archaeologist. I was trained as a, a terrestrial archaeologist. I've been practicing terrestrial archaeology for all of my career. And uh, with a particular interest in, in coastlines and shell middens and the human impact of geologically unstable landscapes. Now, I was aware right from the very beginning, uh, back in 1970, that there was a problem of missing evidence. But like most terrestrial archaeologists, I was very skeptical that anything could be done about it. How would one set about it? What would be left to discover underwater? Would it make any difference? Um, and I think many people still have that feeling. Um, about 15 years ago, I realized that I had to follow the logic of my own argument and get engaged in underwater archaeology. And I've since become involved in a, a number of projects in many parts of the world with collaborative teams. It's clear to me that there is growing momentum and worldwide interest in this problem uh, and that the archaeological investigation of continental shells is a uh, worldwide challenge uh, and there's worldwide interest in how to meet that challenge. I should say that I still practice onshore archaeology and in, in an ideal world one should combine the onshore and the offshore work and try and integrate them. There are two very simple facts that have been staring us terrestrial archaeologists in the face for some many decades now so simple that we've ignored them. Um, rather like the proverbial elephant in the room, we somehow hoped that we could carry on uh, without recognizing the problem. I don't think we can go on doing that. The first very simple fact, well known, but with huge consequences, and that is that sea level has been lower than the present for most of human history. This is a typical sea level curve, generalized curve over the last 200,000 years. Uh, and uh, for 95% of the time, sea levels have been lower than the present. And that means, of course, that if we want to know about the deep history of human interest in coastlines, marine resources, maritime activities, we're missing most of the evidence it's underwater. There are occasional bursts of uh, coastal archaeology. Obviously, after modern sea level established, we see a vast explosion in numbers of coastal sites, shell mounds, hundreds of thousands all around the world. Uh, back at the last high sea level 125 years ago, there is a spike in the marine signatures of some coastal caves. Many archaeologists would like to see this as evidence of intensification associated with a, a modern human revolution or a post-glacial revolution. I think probably what we're looking at is simply a change in the visibility of 
coastlines. Of course, there are caves, coastal caves dotted around the continents uh, that take us back uh, to the last glacial, some of which have fragments of evidence about collecting shellfish and fishing. But that's a very fragmentary and uh, incomplete record and doesn't really help us uh, to illuminate what people were doing on these submerged coastlines. And of course, this uh, cycle of sea level change goes on back into deeper into human history to half a million years, 800,000 years, and even beyond. Uh, the second fact that we have to uh, look at, and this is Simon Fitch's very a uh, useful uh, map showing the extent of drowned landscapes, various estimates, but in round figures, we're talking about 20 million square kilometers of extra land. If you want to know what that means on the ground, uh, think of the size of the present day land mass of Europe and multiply by two. If you want a Southern hemisphere example, take Australia and multiply by three, or the whole of South America. These are huge uh, territories and they're all missing from the record. So we're not only missing coastlines and what people were doing down on the shore, we're missing very extensive uh, terrestrial territories, uh, coastal lowlands, some of which extended for tens, even hundreds of kilometers inland. This is a huge gap in our record. We know it's there and it's time that we try to do something about it. And of course, all this drowned territory, a lot of it was very attractive territory. Um, coastal lowlands typically uh, have milder climates, better water supplies, uh, the lower catchments of rivers and streams, uh, springs, which are believed according to the coastal uh, oasis theory uh, were uh, more uh, strongly flowing on the exposed continental shelf, greater ecological diversity, greater productivity for plants, and animals, wetlands, mangroves, generally speaking, um, relatively attractive territory, uh, especially important during uh, glacial periods when global climate, generally speaking, was more arid and water a more severe limiting factor. I don't want to over-exaggerate this. Not all coastlines are, are uniformly good and not all hinterlands were uniformly bad, but the balance of advantage very often, I suspect, was towards these coastal lowlands. And that is why they're so important to learn more about. Just a, a little bit more uh, detail about sea level curves. Uh, this is Kurt Lambeck's 2014 Curve. This is a, a, a curve of ice equivalent uh, sea level, the amount of or variations in the amount of water in the oceans, it leaving out of account entirely issues of tectonics and isostatic adjustment and so on, which greatly complicate the measurement of relative sea level, uh, especially in places like the North Sea. Um, several things to note about this. First is that sea level stayed low the last glacial maximum uh, below 120 meters with little variation for nearly 15,000 years. Plenty of time for uh, coastlines to become established, uh, marine communities to become established, people living on shorelines to repeatedly visit locations often enough to accumulate archaeologically visible signatures. When we look at these sea level curves, it's very easy to imagine that sea level was going up and down like a yo-yo in the Pleistocene and then stopped at 7,000 years ago and entered a period of stability uh, in recent times. Uh, we have to be careful how we interpret these diagrams. Sea level didn't actually stop rising uh, 6,800 years ago. It has continued to rise slowly through about three meters to the present day. Also, when we see a steep line like this, it's very easy to over-dramatize the effect of sea level rise. The actual rate of sea level rise, the fastest rate, uh, according to the Lambeck diagram, was about one meter, 1 meter, 1.2 meters per 100 years. 
obviously the impact of that will vary depending on the topography of a coastline, but that's not a lot of uh, sea level change. Uh, and uh, by the way, that's the rate at which sea level is rising now. Um, we are predicted to see sea levels up rising by about that amount, a meter to a meter and a half over the next 100 years. So there are cautions to um, state about sea level change and our interpretation. Themes, well, there are so many that I can do barely more than list them. Think about um, population expansion out of Africa, the significance of land bridges. We know there was a lot of land in the Aegean, uh, the Arabian Peninsula, uh, and the so-called Southern Dispersal Route. Submerged landscapes are significant uh, in that region, and there is a lot of controversy about the significance of those submerged landscapes for dispersal, as opposed to climatic changes that periodically uh, turn the interior of the Arabian Peninsula green. Controversy about this southern coastal route around the Indian Ocean Rim. Uh, was it there, was it not? Well, we won't know answers and resolutions to these controversies until we start investigating those submerged landscapes. They don't look very extensive on a map of this scale, but even a small extra increment of land at lowered sea level could be very significant. Then we get to uh, this huge hole in Southeast Asia, two million square kilometers of drowned landscape there alone, and a comparable area in Australia. And uh, those drowned landscapes hold clues to uh, the movement of people into Australia. Um, they were the places that people set off from on their journeys across the sea. And these drowned landscapes in Australia were the uh, locations of first landfall. Helen will talk a lot more about that later. It's the same story in um, North America. Uh, there's now intense interest in uh, population movement across the Bering Land Bridge and then around the edge of the ice sheet. We know that sites uh, were present south of the ice sheet and people must have been going along ice-free corridors in the Northwest Pacific or island hopping. There's a lot of interest in this and a growing number of underwater uh, sites and studies on both the Pacific and the Atlantic coastlines of North America. Uh, intensification of marine resources, development of seafaring was obviously going on during these low civil sea level periods during the last glacial. Colonization of high latitudes, the, the North Sea and Scandinavia and Scotland uh, theme, again happening when sea level, globally speaking, was lower than the present. Uh, turning to the Mediterranean, we know that people were uh, crossing to islands in the Aegean at least 12,000 years ago, perhaps much earlier, and that uh, early farmers had a maritime component, as we know from those very interesting submerged sites along the coastline of Israel, and must have been carrying their crops and their domestic animals uh, by boat uh, across sea crossings, and that that sort of maritime a route was a significant pathway for agricultural expansion into Europe. Again, when sea levels, sea levels were much lower than present, uh, and where were the sites and the settlements and the harbors of these early seafarers? Well, many of them are now underwater. Growth of sedentary settlements and coastal environments, um, they're, they're where you expect big, uh, bigger settlements and permanent settlements to get established. Probably this is something that was happening very early on. And then the big theme, of course, is how did people react to these uh, sea level changes? Uh, not only sea level rising, but sea level falling and exposing new territory to move into. When sea level rises, there's not a lot you can do. Um, you can move if um, that is not too disruptive and the shoreline is not moving too fast. You can build defenses, and there's some interesting evidence that this was happening at least 7,000 years ago, again on one of these submerged sites on the Israeli coastline. You can intensify other aspects of your economy. Uh, you can pray to your gods. And there is some uh, speculation that the concentration of megalithic 
monuments and uh, funerary ritual sites on some coastlines may symbolize that sort of response to the loss of ancestral territory um, by sea level rise. There are a lot of interesting questions here. Uh, sea level change has been endemic in human history and uh, we should pay attention to it. And it's been a, a very dynamic factor that must have interacted with the ways people viewed the world and established social and economic uh, networks. Challenges, lines of investigation. Uh, really, I can only um, uh, sort of in short order describe what they are and say a little bit in more detail about some of them. Mapping of the pre-inundation landscape that is obviously going on. We heard a lot about that yesterday. There's a whole raft of new technologies, techniques, uh, approaches uh, that are being developed. Uh, uh, I've done some of this work in the, in the Red Sea and elsewhere. Other people are doing it. This is really the first step. What was that? Um, now submerged landscape like as a, a landscape of human potential. Where are the animals, the plants, the topography, the rivers, the coastlines, the hills, the valleys, the, the wetlands, and so on. Finding archaeological sites and materials, that of course is a huge challenge. Um, most sites that are known have often been found by chance, um, by people walking along the beach, uh, and seeing things poking up in the intertidal zone, uh, sports divers, fishermen, um, public engagement is important here. Um, and monitoring of what's going on on the shoreline is really a very valuable uh, activity and has been responsible for the discovery of many sites. Uh, we've got uh, more than 3000 fine spots underwater in Europe. We know about, so there's a lot of material there waiting to be discovered. Obviously, life gets more difficult when you go into deeper water. Uh, predictive modeling is being practiced in a number of places, sometimes uh, leading to the discovery of sites and sometimes not. And I think the failures, so-called, uh, are actually just as important as the successes because every underwater survey is teaching us something new about the nature of the seabed and about the visibility or the lack of visibility of archaeological material and that leads to what I think is now turning out to be a very important field of study. Just what is it about uh, sea level rise that means that some sites are destroyed or obscured or disturbed and other sites are preserved. This is the whole area of the study of site formation, deformation, taphonomic issues. Um, uh, uh, Really, um, it's difficult to enunciate any sort of general principles here, um, uh, but rather to try and build up a series of case studies. Um, if there are principles, number one is that most material is vulnerable um, to erosion or damage as sea level rises, and material gets exposed to wave action and shallow water currents. Um, but nevertheless, some material does survive. Why in some places, not in others? Uh, shell middens and caves are natural targets, but in fact, I think many of them have been uh, removed or washed out or deflated in some way, but some haven't. Uh, uh, refuse areas, I will say something about in a moment. Collaboration with offshore industries has produced some spectacular finds and we'll hear more, more about that later. Um, uh, certainly in Western Europe, legislation demands that offshore developers conduct uh, preliminary work, and they often have a lot of money and, give, and can give a lot of help. Uh, international networking and collaboration. Again, I'll say a little bit more in detail about that. There are a number of big networks, uh, splash costs, well known. The Americans are trying to develop something similar that may or may not be called Aquaterra, Splosh, the Southern Hemisphere, South Africa and Australia, marginal seas and so on. The scale of the work that we're engaged on here and the challenges really do demand large scale collaboration across disciplines is the norm in archaeology, but also across national boundaries uh, and collaboration and networks that are worldwide. 
um, because there is a big challenge here and a lot of energy and resource, resources need to work in concert to meet those challenges. Something about preservation and taphonomy. The Danish sites um, are often held out as exemplars of the wonderful preservation, preservation of organic material that we get um, in underwater sites. In fact, it's not quite exactly like that. This is Tuberim Vig, which is one of the most famous of the underwater sites. And what we're looking at here is actually uh, what the Danes call a refuse area. The site itself was on dry land, but offshore is where a lot of material was abandoned or thrown into the water and sunk into the very soft sediments in that shallow water. And that is how they got preserved and in buried in anaerobic sed sediments. And this was before sea level rose. The actual dry land part of the settlement, the important bit, um, has largely been eroded away, except for um, uh, occasional human graves, which of course were already dug into the subsoil and to some extent protected from wave action as sea level rose. But most of what was on the, the, the dwelling area of the settlement has gone, or it's just stone tools and the occasional uh, pit, post hole, or other um, hole dug into the ground. And I think it's quite an interesting analogy here with lake edge sites. Star Car is a classic example. We'll hear more about that later. The orga organic stuff gets preserved because it's been thrown into the shallow water, into the, um, the, uh, the sort of swampy zone at the edge of the lake. On dry land, you basically get stone tools and post holes. And that's all that's left. And there is a paradox here that if material is going to be preserved, it's got to be buried um, under sediment during or before sea level rises, but then it ceases to be visible until something actually starts eroding it, whether it's human action, commercial activity, or uh, submarine channels. Uh, or uh, uh, if one can have technologies that can actually see beneath the surface. Of course, there's a lot of experimentation going on with those sorts of techniques. Shell middens are of great interest to me. We've always assumed that they would be washed away, especially the open air ones, which are the interesting ones. We have underwater shell middens in Denmark now, number that are known. Also in uh, um, the Gulf of Mexico, there's work going on on these sites, uh, recently published in these publications just the other day. Um, there is a problem, of course, of disentangling what are anthropogenic shell accumulations from natural shell accumulations on the seabed. And part of the, the, the technique here and the strategy is to look at um, uh, geochemical and mineralogical signals in narrow diameter cores that can be pushed into the uh, subsurface. Splash costs. Uh, is one of these big networks funded by uh, European money uh, to the tune of about half a million euros uh, and has really been a powerful accelerant uh, in the development of the field in Europe uh, with money for meetings, for training, for publications. Uh, it was a huge um, enterprise and it uh, leveraged and stimulated a great deal of new research and grant applications uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, influenced uh, quite significantly policy makers. We brought together heritage managers, industry representatives, marine geoscientists, archaeologists, and so on. And of course, there are a number of publications. Um, at, at the current count, seven edited volumes came out of that uh, networking. The ones in red are freely available on the uh, internet as open access or downloadable, and two big websites. Uh, you can find them by on any internet search engine. Splashcos is the uh, network website with all this information. The Splashcos Viewer is an online database that was also created as part of the Splashcos enterprise, and that again is publicly accessible. So we are, in my view, embarking on a new research agenda. I still think we are in a pioneer phase at the beginning of what is probably going to turn out to be a 50-year research agenda. 
but I'm convinced that uh, uh, there are going to be new developments and that they're going to change our view of world prehistory. 20 years ago, Nikki Milner and I published a paper posing the question, are coastlines central or peripheral? Uh, increasingly, I think the answer is they're central and that they have been marginalized by conventional uh, views, which are mainly Eurocentric and Anglophone, about the nature of prehistoric developments as a basically an on-land uh, process. I think coastlines and the dynamics that go with sea level change have played a very significant and so far um, under-recognized role in world prehistory. So plenty to do and plenty to think about and a lot of new work waiting to be done. That's, that's me finished, thank you. Excellent, Th thank, thanks, thanks Jeff for there. I'm sure you'll be around in 50 years to see it through as well. <laughs> yeah. uh, Who knows? All right, um, right. Um, there's, there's uh, so far, please do send in your, your, any questions. There's a, a comment more than a, a anything from Trevor Faulkner um, about sea level rise in uh, the Swedish Baltic coast at 0.3 to 0.5 millimetres per year, um, I presume, the context. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to read these. Yes. Um, uh, I'm, what is the question? It, is, it seems to be a, a statement. More it's the same. Okay. But I, but I myself have a question. Yes. It's given that you're, it's a global talk. Well, how do you think the um, government strategies are, are operating in the areas that you, you, you're active within? It, I mean, you know, we've, we, everyone is talking about the level of resource needed. And these, this is clearly going to, even if, even if um, um, industry is generous, I'm presuming there must be action on government. It's a very mixed picture, uh, as far as I know. Um, there's a lot of talk um, and a lot of uh, lip service, um, but of course, everything lies in the implementation. Some countries have signed up to the UNESCO um, uh, protocol on, on underwater. Uh, material, but uh, signing up to it is one thing, implementing it is another. Um, there is EU legislation um, for those kind of countries that are EU members, which has proved very uh, productive. And big industries, of course, often see the public relations benefit of putting money into um, archeological investigation. It's peanuts as far as they're concerned to spend a couple of million on some archaeological research with their billion dollar, billion pound budgets, but with a good return in terms of um, public relations. Uh, legislation in Australia doesn't yet cover uh, indigenous archaeology, only historic wrecks and aeroplanes and so on. Uh, Saudi Arabia, um, nothing much there at the moment. There is interest, but inevitably, even if there is government uh, legislation, it all depends on the money. Uh, and even with monitoring, there may not be uh, much incentive to spend a lot of money on um, mitigation work. Okay. There's um, um, a, a question from Harry Robson. Um, great talk, Jeff. We all agree. Um, are there any hotspots where you envisage further submerged shell middens to be found? Well, um, uh, I mentioned briefly, but didn't really expand on it, certainly around the coastlines of the Gulf of Mexico, um, southeast corner of the United States, uh, Georgia, um, Florida, coming around that coastline. A lot of this material is now beginning to um, be discovered. Uh, some of it has been known about, but uh, as I said, it's quite difficult sometimes to be sure that you've got a, a, a <coughs> archaeological site rather than a natural feature. Um, I think these shallow uh, uh, coastlines uh, are promising and of course that's where you would expect to find the extensive mudflats and, uh, and shell beds that generate the volume of material. Um, I, I think we're, we're feeling our way here. Uh, the big 
turning point will come and I think will bring a lot more people on board when we start getting at material at much deeper levels, which of course will be much earlier in date, 20,000, 60,000 years ago. And we don't really know how shell middens or any other sort of material uh, would be preserved at that sort of depth um, and how we would um, discover it. But uh, I think those are challenges that we should envisage and try and meet in the future.